So I've been asked to calculate many weird different things over the years, but usually I stick to dealing with just fictional media. But on at least one or two occasions I've theorized on real life. One of my favorite videos is when I calculated the calories packed into a real life gingerbread house. The other one was when I calculated how fast you need to swim in order to evaporate all of the water in a pool due to friction. So now it's just a matter of pulling out my busted and rusted yet subsequently trusted solar powered calculating device. And you'd need to swim with 20,276.4 kilometers per hour. According to rotational physics, that's 2,525 full strokes every second. Now, that video was slightly flawed, but it still discussed quite an interesting concept. And there was a demand for a follow-up to it, which was the question nobody had asked in the history of ever, how fast would a person need to run in order to light themselves on fire? It's been seen in countless television shows and movies, but let's put the cap on this question once and for all. Hello, I'm The Theorizer, and this is going to be fun. But first, I want to highlight something to all you persnickety physics teachers out there. This video is going to only deal with the basics, running to catch on fire due to friction in the air around you. I'm not going to be including the cooling effect of the wind as it glides across the body, I'm just going to include the air and friction, the basics, because that's all that really matters in a standard video like this. So enough of my insipid dawdling, here's the short answer. You would need to run fast, like really fast, but how fast is really fast when we're dealing with ambiguous fastness such as this genre of fast, well it's fast, or should I give an actual number? Okay, fine, but we'll need to know a few things first. Our test subject today is Bob, because as you all know, I call all of my test subjects Bob. So what is Bob Bobby Robertson wearing? Bob is wearing a normal t-shirt and shorts, the usual. So what we need to find out is how fast he'd need to run to catch his cotton clothing on fire. Let's get to it. To find out the speed he'd need to run at, we first need to figure out the energy he'd create by catching on fire, and then converting it into the energy of the wind against him. And remember, physics teachers, we aren't factoring in things like the redundant sound energy produced by the sonic boom and all that nonsense. We are just assuming all of it's conserved between the two. Basic Bob is basic. Once we have the energy produced by the friction, we can convert it to the force of friction, and using the formula I hate using, we can find the speed you'd need to run at. Pretty easy. And now I'll say 140 digits of pi in under 5 seconds. I think I got that right, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But memorization is key, so it's very easy to find out how much heat is produced. It can be found like this. Multiply the temperature by how heavy Bob is, and by how flammable the cotton is. So Bob weighs the average at around 150 pounds, or in other words, 68 kilos. I don't know why people are so spooked by math. It's just a small little formula that we fill in, and we can figure out anything we want. That's why I like it. So next we need to figure out how flammable cotton is. This is something known as the specific heat capacity. It is a very easy number to find since, you know, Google! And using my favorite website in the world, we discovered that this number is 1400. Ding dong, temperature's next! So the temperature is actually a couple of things. It isn't just how burnt the clothes are, it's also how hot it is around Bob. According to Google, cotton starts to catch fire at 120 degrees Celsius or 250 Fahrenheit. Surprisingly high! And let's just assume that Bob is running around in a normal room. Normal rooms have a temperature known quite uncreatively as room temperature, and it's around 25 Celsius. Now all we need to do is change these temperatures to a new kind of unit called Kelvin. This is just so that we don't get any negative temperatures and whatnot. So I think that was pretty easy, right? 
Maybe I'm the only one who likes it. Help me. So using this abysmal calculator I stole from a nearby university, we can multiply 68.18 times 1400 times 1673.2 minus 298.15 equals dun 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 <laughs> 131.25 megajoules of energy. Do you know how much energy that is? It's the same amount as if you were to eat 1,568,490 starbursts. To burn that kind of stuff off, Bob would need to run for two decades. I'm not joking. Literally, I have no sense of humor. Help me. So now that we know how much energy it would take to light Bob Bobby Robertson's obviously fancy clothing on fire, we can use it to figure out how fast he would have to run. Luckily for us, energy is conserved, meaning that since I'm making this as basic as I possibly can, we already know the energy of the air friction. Boom! That's how it's done! So now, this finally might get a little bit tricky. Take a look at this Illuminati pyramid. As you can see, we can change energy into force simply by knowing the distance, but it gets a bit hard here since I don't know what the distance is. It's all a matter of how quickly you'd want to go up in flames. So I took to Twitter and asked you guys how Bob's fate would go down. I felt mixed emotions as I watched this poor test subject's fate lie in the hands of the sadistic population who wanted him to burn as slowly and painfully as possible. Sickos. But unfortunately, you guys managed to ruin me by making it nearly a three-way tie, so I guess I'll just have to come up with the distance myself. But hold on. Let's think very realistically. If Bob wants to catch on fire, he'll want to do it as quickly as possible probably in around a minute. So what we can do here is switch things around a bit. Since speed times time is distance, and we need the distance, we can rearrange things and make it work. And we know the time, 60 seconds, but the speed is still the thing we need to look for. So what we should finally do now is look at the big formula that was supposed to find the velocity, aka speed. The friction around Bob is actually the resistance of the air blowing on him, and the wind force can be found using the drag equation, a formula which I use way too much on this channel to the point of me using it being a meme. The force we were supposed to find is equal to a number that corresponds to the shape of Bob, times Bob's frontal area, times the density of the air around him, times the velocity he's running at, all divided by 2. And since we know that the force is actually the energy divided by velocity and time, we can flip things around a bit to figure out just the speed Bob would need to sprint at. And we end up with quite a large equation, but do not fear, we'll take it one step at a time. It only looks big. So, if we assume Bob's just running in a normal environment, then the density of the air should be normal, which is about 1.2 kilograms of air for every cubic meter of space that it takes up. Air's quite light if you hadn't noticed. Next, we need to know the area his front takes up. If you remember from my other video, we assume that Bob was sort of a rectangular shape. And since normal people are 5 foot 7 and 40 inches wide, we can find Bob's area quite easily. If you don't remember from the boring boring math classes you hopefully took in school, a rectangle's area can be found by multiplying the width by the height. Boom Bob, we're in business. 1.671 square meters. Next, we have to deal with Bob's shape. Now, I don't have a wind tunnel at home, so I had to look up the number that corresponds to the shape of a running person. And I found 1.2. That was easy. And we're nearly finished. All we really need is the time, but we already said that it was 60 seconds. So multiplying the top and bottom, dividing, and then cube rooting, we finally have our answer. Bob would need to sprint at an incredible velocity of 436.4 kilometers an hour, about 270 miles an hour. Some would say that's low, but remember, average people run at a measly 13 miles an hour, and the fastest runner in the world, Usain Bolt, ran at just under 28 miles an hour. They get away first time, Tyson Gay right alongside Usain Bolt, but here he goes, streaking away already, it's Bolt all the way, he's looking round at Gay, watch the clock, it's gone! Most normal cars can't even go this fast, and remember, we're going to be doing this for over 60 seconds, whereas Usain Bolt ran 100 meters in only 9.5 seconds. Bob would have run over a kilometer in that same time, so it's definitely not as slow as it sounds. If we were to change things around a bit and say that Bob took 10 seconds instead of 60, then he'd need to be running at almost 800 kilometers an hour to catch on fire. But remember, 
All of this is only for his clothing. So what about his skin? What if our test subject was running nude? So we can do literally everything the exact same, except we need to change the temperature and heat capacity. Easy. After looking up these things for human skin, we discover that a velocity of 510 kilometers an hour would burn the skin of a human. So this is all fine and good for humans, but after I established all of this, I figured I could keep it going. So now I propose the question. How fast would you need to throw a cake in order for it to be cooked by the air? This is a very strange question to answer, but we can do it in the exact same way we did the other one. So I looked up the mass of a cake, its width, its heat capacity, the time to cook it, the temperature to cook it at, the aerodynamic properties of its rectangular shape, the density of air, and I finally received the velocity, which is very, very scarily low, only about 86 kilometers an hour. You see, the numbers were very high and everything was good, but when I divided by the 30 minutes it took to cook it, the speed, it just dropped drastically. But it's the truth. The only reason it seems that low is because I'm not involving the wind chill. So this is a surprising revelation that changes nothing, but there's also the matter of it hitting the ground before it actually gets cooked. If you throw it overhand, but perfectly horizontal to your head, how fast must you launch it? Well, since Bob is 5'7 and gravity is pulling down with 9.8 meters per second squared, the true answer to this question is 8,830 meters per second, although it would burn the cake apart. To launch such a cake from your hands, you'd need to hold it about two feet back and then throw it with 44.8 million newtons. This is the equivalent to lifting around 32 blue whales, all at once. So all of this begs the question, what else can we figure out? How about this? How fast would you need to fire a bullet for it to melt from air friction? Now this is a very interesting concept and I'm quite intrigued to get to this answer. And because I love to exaggerate things to their maximum, let's say this bullet will be made of tungsten, one of the heaviest and most heat-resistant metals that a bullet could be made of. So going back to MCAT, we find that if it's made of tungsten, then it has a melting point of around 3683 Kelvin. Assuming a normal environment, room temperature is 298.15 Kelvin. A bullet made of tungsten is going to be extremely heavy, and to make it as ridiculously as I possibly can, I'm going to make it a .50 BMG rifles bullet, which is usually around 50 grams, if it's lead or other light materials, but if it's tungsten, on the other hand, that would go up to 85 grams, which is significantly higher. Finally, tungsten has a specific heat capacity of 134 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Multiplying it all together, holy crap, that's a lot of energy. Assuming that Bob wants this bullet to melt immediately after shooting, we'll assume that the time will be around a quarter of a second. Finally, at our last formula, all we need to do is look up the usuals. Since bullets are extremely aerodynamic, they should be quite fast, and they are. At about 6,700 kilometers an hour, this is the fastest speed we've calculated all day. Even though these are hypersonic speeds, it don't matter. I'm keeping it basic. But things get really amazing when you realize that if you're about one foot thick and this bullet somehow hit you before it melted, it would go through you with a pressure of 265 imperial tons per square inch. If it didn't melt, that bullet would keep on going, probably through literally anything it wanted. If this thing wasn't slowed by the force of going through your body, and it was headed for a giant block of solid stainless steel, it would lodge itself a whole three inches into it. Quite the bullet. Quite the force. And so, that's all I have today. There will be some more physics videos coming up soon, and a bunch of videos on movie lore and the usual. Until next time, I'm The Theorizer.